Hi there! In this video we're going to do something a little different. I don't want to exclusively talk about games on this channel, I'd like to really stretch my wings a bit on this one. So today I'd like to talk a bit about how we approach movie critique. I'm not knowledgeable enough about literary theory to do this on a purely general level, but I've recently developed a new opinion on a certain brand of YouTube-based movie reviews, and since it's easier for me to explain this in regards to a concrete example, I have chosen Red Letter Media's Plinket review of Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Red Letter Media are an independent film production company mostly known for making YouTube videos about movies. Their breakout and my first exposure to them were a series of reviews about the Star Wars prequels featuring the persona Harry S. Plinkett, also known as the Plinkett Reviews. They also have ongoing shows Half in the Bag, which is mostly off-the-cuff conversational movie reviews, and Best of the Worst, which involves them making fun of utterly terrible movies. I used to greatly value their opinions on film, mostly because I had no idea what makes a good movie and they knew a lot more than I did about movie production and definitely had more experience with the medium than I ever will. I've recently drastically rethought my approach to quality in movies, mostly due to YouTuber H Bomber Guy and his comically long, very in-depth analysis of video games and TV shows. Other YouTubers like Sean Engine, if that is his real name, also solidified my new approach to these things. Very fittingly, Red Letter Media's Plinket review of the movie Rogue One was the reason I originally skipped it entirely, while H Bomber Guy's recommendation prompted me to finally watch it after all recently. Full disclosure, I really like the film, and you'll probably understand why at the end of this video, but that's not really the point of the exercise. Instead, I want to re-examine Red Letter Media's coverage of Rogue One and their approach to critique and to assigning a rating of quality to it. The point here is not to prove that Rogue One is genius, nor that people who don't like it are stupid or ignorant. I think it's very important that we treat people who disagree with us on things like movie quality with basic human decency and respect. Mr. Plinkett talks about Rogue One is actually a bit unusual for the series. Other Plinkett Star Wars reviews run between about an hour and almost two hours. This video is rather short at 7 minutes and 32 seconds. Harry S. Plinkett is, as previously stated, a persona, played by Red Letter Media founder Mike Stoklasa. I'll address my thoughts and commentary at Mike for simplicity here. Let's go. Why hello, it's me, Mr. Plinkett. I'd like to talk very briefly about Disney's Marvel's Star Wars Rogue One Star Wars Story by Disney a conglomerate corporation. There's been a lot of discussion on this movie recently. Some say it's the worst thing since the prequels, while others say it's the best Star Wars movie ever because it's got the best action and the most explosions. Boy, what do I even start? The intro seems harmless enough, but it already prepares you for what's to come later. Mike is already harping on the fact that Lucasfilm is now a property of Disney. By emphasizing this, he's already portraying the film not on its own merits, but instead as a cynical cash grab with no artistic merit. Keep this in mind, it'll come up again later. Then, as you do, he gives a sentence about the uh, controversy he's about to weigh in on, but he already misrepresents it. He only mentions two opinions on the movie, which makes it appear as though they were the only opinions there are. With this he's emphasizing one very general opinion, that it's bad for various reasons, and one very specific opinion, that it's good precisely because of one element of the film. No other opinions matter here. Okay, let's get to his first argument. In filmmaking there's a concept called the triangle of truth. This idea includes three things, fast, cheap, and good. The idea goes that you can't have all three. You can make it fast and cheap, but it's not going to be good. And you can make it good and fast, but it's not going to be cheap. And so on. You get the idea, I hope. Sure, there's a certain logic to the idea that for a movie to be good, it either needs a budget or it needs time. He doesn't apply this concept to Rogue One itself, but I think I don't have to tell you that budget was not a problem with Rogue One. This was one expensive movie and it took over a year to make, which suggests that the basic financial necessities for quality 
were absolutely met. But if he doesn't apply this concept to the movie, then why is he bringing it up? I'm gonna apply a similar concept to a Star Wars movie. Except my triangle will include these items. Characters, story, and emotion. These are more check marks rather than a triangular formula. But just stick with me for a minute, I'll explain it. This is completely baffling to me. This is nothing like the Triangle of Truth. At all! The Triangle of Truth exists to point out that you can't make a quality movie quickly and cheaply. It's three points that are incompatible with each other. This is a checklist of things that he personally requires a Star Wars movie to have to make it good. Quality is a part of the Triangle of Truth. With his checklist, it's the result of a fully checked list. So, seeing how the connection between the two concepts is so strenuous, why did he even bring it up? My guess would be that the Triangle of Truth is an easy to understand concept that has an air of wisdom to it. Associating his own personal checklist of things a movie definitely needs to have is more than likely supposed to make this checklist seem less subjective and personal and more universally valid. As you'll soon see, certain films can include all three. The original Star Wars trilogy succeeded so well because they hit all the marks. Humor and action is essentially this. You can just eat the icing on the cake, which is tasty, but you'll get real fat. A fat joke. Real mature. Gotta get a laugh out of people somehow, am I right? You'll get cavities and your teeth will rot out. And after eating too much, you'll start to get sick of it. You need a nice soft cake to balance it all out. Just like the Force! All is as the Force wills it. Remember the Force? Okay, but to his actual point. I do agree that action and humor do not commonly carry a movie for me. And they mostly serve to enhance other parts of the film. Action scenes in particular really benefit from being tied well into the rest of the movie by the theme, stakes in the plot, and investment in the characters. So fair enough. Oh, and I guess he liked the story and characters in the original trilogy, and it made him feel... emotions. Okay, I assume he means positive emotions like joy, excitement, and relief, but he doesn't specify this. Let's take a look at The Force Awakens. Now I hit two out of three marks, which made it passable. Our characters had some likable qualities to them. You set me up for it. it that was, was pretty good. Moments that made them feel like real people, which helped us connect. We rooted for them, we felt for them, and we suffered with them. No! Thus, we had an emotional connection when shit hit the fan. If The Force Awakens didn't retread a New Hope's plot, it'd get a big check mark right here. But it did. And I don't think I need to go into this any further. The Force Awakens was passable because it got two out of three check marks from him. Note that he's still gauging entirely subjective things here. This means that in his mind, the movie's quality is fairly directly linked to his enjoyment of it. It's the way he phrases it. He doesn't say he found it passable. He said that the check marks made it passable. The check marks on characters and emotions. But at least he does very shortly talk about why he liked the characters, because of moments that helped us connect. You think I'm reading too much into this? We'll see. Oh, we'll see. Now let's look at Rogue One. Let's just get this over with, shall we? I got no check marks from me. Yes, Rogue One had humor. There's a 26% chance of failure. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not sure. Anyone would really come this way. We're close. We're close, I know that. Well, now there's a 35% chance of I failure. I don't want to know. Thank you. I understand. Some of the best, most awesomest Star Wars explosions ever. Okay, so here's where the checkmark thing pays off. Rogue One didn't get any. Now I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. Mike presented the Triangle of Truth as a well-known truism about film. He then came up with a checklist for movies to be enjoyable to him and tied that very, very loosely to the triangle thing, implying that it is an equally valid truism. As I've stated before, these are incredibly subjective. These are the things that Mike is looking for in a Star Wars movie. These are not necessarily things that other viewers will be looking for. 
The list does not include things like symbolism, deeper meaning, new perspectives on the setting or morals. These are some things that other people are looking for in movies and they are no more or less valid than the points Mike has made mandatory here. So basically what he's saying is Here's the thing about opinions. They're all wrong unless they're mine. He says this at the start of the video as a joke. Not sure if he did this out of a lack of self-awareness or specifically to deflect criticism, but the thing to note here is that this facetious assertion mirrors how Mike actually views movies. A movie is good if I like it. If I like a movie, it must be good. And on the point of Rogue One, if I didn't like a movie, it must be bad. And this is an incredibly simplistic way of looking at films, or anything for that matter. Okay, that out of the way, let's just go with it. Let's say, for the sake of argument, a Star Wars movie does indeed need those three things to be good. There's still over four minutes left in the video. Surely he'll use those to give us a brief understanding of why Rogue One failed on all three fronts, right? Nope. But it received no check marks from me for obvious reasons. What chance do we have? The question is what choice? Run, hide, plead for mercy, scatter your forces. You give way to an enemy this evil with this much power and you condemn the galaxy to an eternity of submission. He spends 20 seconds of this very limited time asserting that the failings of Rogue One are obvious and then just playing a laughing track over a scene from the movie. Look, Mike, in case you didn't know, this sort of thing is only an obvious argument against the movie for people who already agree with you. I found that scene a bit corny too, but it's not laughably bad. Please do enlighten us what's so funny about the scene. You're here to tell us why the movie is bad, right? So explain! Now let's compare two scenes. Are you ready? This is a scene from Rogue One. Cassian, Andor, and Jin Erzo have a shootout with stormtroopers in some kind of city. Pretty great, huh? Pretty exciting. Now here's a similar scene from A New Hope. Get behind me, get behind me. There's one difference between these two scenes. One contains characters we actually like. Can't get out that way. Looks like you managed to cut off our only escape route. Maybe you'd like it back in your cell, your highness. Hear them saying things to each other? We understand their perspectives. It's like we know them. I can't hold off forever. Now what? This is some rescue. We like them. Okay, wow, this is nonsense. All right, if I get this point correctly, Mike is saying that the scene in A New Hope, no, actually, that A New Hope as a whole is better than Rogue One as a whole because there's a fight scene where characters talk in A New Hope and there's a fight scene where the characters don't talk in Rogue One. This is, according to Mike, a clear and obvious indicator that the characters are bad and nobody cares for them. Now anybody who thinks about this for even a second is gonna say, no way, his point can't possibly be that the characters aren't talking, it's more about the fact that the characters are well written enough to have something to talk about even during the fight. Well that's not what he says. And also he then does this. Now here's my re-edit when you have a movie written with unlikable characters who have nothing to say. Without characters we like, it's really just people fighting with stormtroopers. He just edits out the dialogue from the scene from New Hope and shows that it's boring. But this is either idiotic or dishonest and I have too much respect for Mike to assume the former, so I can only assume the latter. See, what Mike doesn't tell you is that these two scenes are pretty different, despite both being fight scenes with stormtroopers. The scene from A New Hope is focused on the conversation that's happening during the fight. It's shot that way with most shots focusing very closely on the characters talking. 
is not much of an action scene because it's not shot very dynamically. Thus, when you take out the dialogue, the scene has nothing to stand on but the action which the scene doesn't focus on, so of course it's boring. On the other hand, the scene from Rogue One is a straight up action scene. It exists to show the characters actually fighting and to make that fight look interesting. It also serves the purpose of quickly establishing that Jin can hold her own against the Stormtrooper or two. To reinforce my point, let's look at another scene from Rogue One and a scene from the Return of the Jedi. Did you know that wasn't me? Huh. Of course. I thought I told you to stay on the ship. You did, but I thought it was boring and you were in trouble. There are a lot of explosions for two people blending in. You're right. I should just wait on the ship. Yes! Great character stuff! Jin tries to act like she wouldn't have accidentally shot K2SO and he is being a snarky ass and criticizing their inability to not make a huge ruckus. Okay, Return of the Jedi time. Oh man, look at this! These terrible characters so bad they don't have anything to say. Imagine if Rogue One had been like this. Terrible this way, isn't it? What a great insight that a dialogue scene becomes boring and stale if you cut out the dialogue. This goes to show that it's really fucking easy to make unfavorable comparisons between two movies if you just arbitrarily pick and choose scenes to compare and either don't understand what the scenes are for and what they mean or don't care. Now that I have reached peak sarcasm, let's get on to the next point Mike wants to make. And finally, context. Without the Star Wars IP and familiar things, imagine Rogue One as a movie called People Trying to Get Plans for a Super Weapon. What? Why? What? Okay, okay, fine. Let's see where he's going with this. These characters would just be generic science fiction characters. This guy would be talking about some kind of mystical thing we never get to see. And we're just told what it is, sort of. May the Force be with us. The Force? Then these things would probably just look like this. Generic science fiction machines or robots or, or weapons. Yeah, if you take a movie that was made to be part of the Star Wars universe and strip out all the Star Wars, then it gets kind of weird and confusing. <laughs> <laughs> no shit! We ask ourselves, who's in charge? Who's our main bad guy? Is it that guy? Is it this other guy? Is it that weird guy in a Halloween costume? Why are these two guys mucking up the story? Who's our main bad guy? Who's our main bad guy? Seriously? Really? The Empire! See, here Mike finally openly displays his terrible approach to movie criticism. He's not content to let the movie speak for itself. He's constantly looking for meta reasons for things in the movie, rather than looking at them within the context of the movie itself. To him, Craddock should have been the main bad guy and Tarkin and Vader should not have been here. He thinks that those two are only here because they're known and popular. And while that is certainly a reason for their inclusion, that's not the only purpose they serve in the finished film. Mike expects a movie that has a simple enemy, personified by one heinous evil bastard. But that's not what he got, and he decides it's a mistake. He never realizes that perhaps it's deliberate. You see, Rogue One isn't like the original trilogy. Rogue One is a lot more interested in actually looking at the two factions in the war that is central to the series rather than glossing over them in favor of the main characters. The antagonist 
is not any one bad guy. The antagonist is the empire itself. And the movie uses not one, not three, but five different characters to represent it. Or rather, different aspects of it. First, there's of course Krennic and Tarkin, who together fill the role of showing us what the leadership structure in the Empire looks like and what motivates the people at the top. They're immoral, selfish, ambitious men, more concerned with backstabbing each other and amassing power and influence than any cause. Next up, Vader is of course representative of the core of the Empire, the reason it exists at all, which is, well, two evil space wizards. Vader is here to remind you that as evil and petty as the Empire's administration may be, there's something even worse lurking behind it all. And then there's Galen and Bodhi. Both are smaller cogs in the Imperial machine with no real control over the whole thing. They're both good people who work for the Empire either by choice or by force, and they both decide to follow their conscience and do something about it. They defect and they fight back against tyranny. The Empire is a fascist state with a cutthroat politics so common in them, but populated by some good people who fight back against the odds. Plus space wizards. Mike doesn't see this. To him, there's a bunch of unrelated characters all muddying the waters around who we're supposed to root against when, viewed a little more closely, they allow us to understand what the Empire is and how it works better than the original trilogy ever did. Now, I'm not saying that this is a better approach to a villain, than having one visible bad guy. That's going to depend on your opinions. I personally favor Rogue One's approach, but that's neither here nor there. My problem with this video is that Mike doesn't even consider or at least mention this. He's just kinda mad that his expectations haven't been met and doesn't look any further than that. And how the heck did that one guy in the giant plastic helmet choke that other guy like that? Nobody told me. The Force is what gives the Jedi his power. It's an energy field created by all living things. It Again, yes, if you take a movie that was made with an audience in mind that already knows Star Wars, and then remove all the Star Wars stuff, it won't make a lot of sense. How is that a point against the film, Mike? Also showing us that the movie has explosions in it does in no way, shape or form mean that the explosions came at the expense of other parts of the film. All Star Wars movies have action scenes. This is nonsense, man. Then finally, without context, the whole movie is basically that these guys have a thing that could do this. These people aren't gonna try and stop the thing. They're just gonna get the plans to do it later? After the movie is over? At the end of the film, we'd ask ourselves, Oh, well, they didn't stop that thing? And everyone died? This doesn't feel like an ending. Ah, yes. The true and tried technique of thoughtful film critique called breaking down the plot of a movie so far it sounds simple and stupid. Empire Strikes Back is a bunch of people have to flee from some other people and find a way to not get murdered by those people. And in the end, they only narrowly avoid getting murdered. It's not a very satisfying ending, I mean shit, they didn't even kill the main bad guy. See how it cuts both ways? People who have actually seen the movie with their eyes open will tell you that there's more to the movie than that. Also, we'd ask ourselves why the dad didn't just tell Jin his daughter that all they needed to do was shoot a proton torpedo in the exhaust port. You know, the one at the end of the trench. Do we really need to steal the complicated plans just to tell somebody that? Yeah. Nitpicking. Good. Yes. Here's the thing with nitpicks. They're only problems if you don't like the movie, or they're so big they cannot be justified. You don't like the movie, so you're unwilling to assume that there might be a good reason that Galen Erso didn't have better information to give. I like the movie, and thus I am perfectly willing to come up with an explanation which isn't even complicated. You see, large construction projects are often not the work of a single person. Galen Erso most likely spent all this time designing the gun on the Death Star, the weapon and its generators. You don't need a super genius like him to build a spacecraft because that's known technology. It would make sense to let Galen focus on the weapon itself while other people designed the space station around it. Which would explain why Galen would not know about the layout beyond the weapon. So you'd need the plans of the Death Star to find a way to attack the weak point he does know about. 
nitpicks are not that useful in gauging the actual quality of a movie. They're details, and pretty much all movies have little holes like this. In the end, without relying heavily on context, you just have a sci-fi movie without a satisfying ending, with confusing motivations, uninteresting characters, and no emotional investment. <sighs> okay, this response to a 7.5 minute video is getting long enough, and I really want to get into defending every damn aspect of the film. So, I'll just say this. The ending is only unsatisfying if you can only get satisfaction from a movie in which the outcome is an unambiguous victory for the heroes. The film was about a bunch of regular people fighting back against the overpowering enemy that wrecked their lives and dying just to keep the one thing alive that the rebellion needs to function. And the movie isn't even subtle about what that is. Rebellions are built on hope. Rebellions are built on hope. Your Highness, the transmission we received. What is it they've sent us? Hope. The weak point and the Death Star plans are symbols of hope, both in the story and on a meta level. That's what they're fighting for. And they succeed with horrible casualties. How is this bad? I thought you liked emotions. Well, this is a tragic story. They tend to end tragically. Fuck it. I'm also saying this. The motivations of the characters are only unclear if you watch the movie with your eyes closed and your ears plugged up. And if I do it? We'll make sure you go free. Who are they? The guardians of the wills. Protectors of the Kyber Temple. But there's nothing left to protect, so now they're just causing trouble for everybody. I've placed a weakness deep within the system. A flaw so small and powerful they will never find it. But Jin, Jin, if you're listening, my beloved, so much of my life has been wasted. I try to think of you. Only in the moments when I'm strong because the pain of not having you with me, your mother, our family, the pain of that loss is so overwhelming I risk failing even now. It's just so hard not to think of you. I will tell him that I will be taking control over the weapon I first spoke of years ago, effective immediately. <laughs> we stand here amidst my achievement, not yours! Your father. He said I could get right by myself. He said I could make it right if I was brave enough to listen to wars in my heart and do something about it. Guess it was too late. Where are you going? I'm gonna follow Jin. Her path is clear. Alone? Good luck. I don't need luck. I have you. We don't all have the luxury of deciding when and where we want to care about something. <laughs> Suddenly the rebellion is real for you. Some of us live it. I've been in this fight since I was six years old. You're not the only one who lost everything. Some of us, most of us, we've all done terrible things on behalf of the rebellion. Spies, saboteurs, assassins. Everything I did, I did for the rebellion. And every time I walked away from something I wanted to forget, I told myself it was for a cause that I believed in. A cause that was worth it. Without that, we're lost. Everything we've done would have been for nothing. But if you've already decided the movie's crap before you've seen it, you're not gonna pay as much attention, obviously. My point is, just go ahead and eat all that icing. Don't worry, you won't get diabetes. Try not to get too much of it in your beards. Ah, we've reached peak condescension. Just because you couldn't give it any of your stupid check marks, that means the only thing left to enjoy is the lesser action check mark. The movie has nothing else. And of course, you'd see it this way if you slept through the movie as you seem to have done. The movie is bad, so it's not worth thinking about. No sense in analyzing its themes, its meaning, and the purposes of the different characters. 
and the roles they play. Okay, we're at the end of the video, but I haven't yet addressed the bigger point he has made here. Not really. What he's saying is that the movie could not stand on its own without the context of the Star Wars franchise. And this is somehow a bad thing. He never explains why this is a bad thing. He just asserts that the only reason people like it is because it has superficial Star Wars elements in it. He assumes the movie is just leeching off the Star Wars coat of paint to have any value at all. But what he doesn't understand is that Rogue One is not just a movie set in the Star Wars universe, it's a new perspective on that universe. You see, the original movies never really got into the street level goings on of the Galactic Civil War. We saw stormtroopers, rebel soldiers and pilots, but they never had much of a role and mostly served to show that a war was happening. Rogue One makes these characters, these normal people who are vital to the war effort, the main focus of the story. Further, it shows us new angles on the Empire and the Rebel Alliance. The Empire is humanized, less a giant implacable machine of evil and more a horrifying fascist military dictatorship with petty political struggles and a few good people who just need a little push to do the right thing and fight back. The Alliance is shown as a fragile coalition of rebels that often has to engage in less than savory activities to not get horribly crushed. Rogue One not only stands on its own with its own themes and ideas. For me personally, it enhances the rest of the series. Now you can disagree with that and that's fine. But you Mike, you don't just disagree, do you? You assert that none of this exists. To you, there's nothing but action and the surface level Star Wars theme. And you are confident to say so when you yourself have completely missed the entire point of the fucking film. You couldn't follow the character's simple, often outright stated motivations. You couldn't conceive of the movie doing anything with the setting other than wallow in it. And you have the fucking gall to tell me that people who disagree with your half-formed, ignorant, shallow interpretation of the movie are idiots. Try not to get too much of it in your beards. Others say it's the best Star Wars movie ever because it's got the best action and the most explosions. So in conclusion, this video is terrible. It exists for the sole purpose of Mike Stoklasa shitting all over a movie he never gave any chance and worse, shitting all over people simply for liking something. It's fine to have an opinion. It's fine to like or dislike this movie. But please, if you go and make an online video about your opinion, please make sure you at least try to understand what it's about, what it's for, and why people like it, instead of arrogantly assuming your first gut reaction to it is the only valid opinion to have. Please also let the movie stand for what it is. This meta horseshit about Disney being in charge and Star Wars stuff being forced into it has blinded you to the points some of these elements serve. Sure, there are a few parts in the movie where the references got a bit out of hand, but you focus so hard on that that you refuse to give the film a fair shake. And the result is a worthless, shallow and pointless nitpicking that only exists for people who already share your views. And Red Letter Media are not the only people to indulge in the sort of incredibly shallow movie review that prioritize entertainment value over critical analysis. Entertainment is certainly fine too. I like being entertained. But if your entertainment comes at the expense of the hard work of a lot of people, and at the expense of people whose only crime is enjoying a movie, then your entertainment is just shit. Okay, I'm finally through with this. I can get my- Hello, it's me, Mr. Plinker. I'm back. Oh, no. The brain dead fanboys, like you. Oh, God, no. Why do the stormtroopers even wear armor if a blunt object will kill them? No, I can't do this anymore. I can't. Holy shit, why is this allowed? Somebody help! Damn, that was negative and shouty. Hope it was a bit of fun anyway. Where do you stand on this? Am I overreacting? Probably. I just like to think that we can do a lot better than letting our preconceived notions determine how we approach media. I like to end on a positive note, so I'll say here that I'm not familiar with a lot of red letter media's work beyond the Plinkett stuff. 
it's very possible that these guys aren't always this wrong and they just have a bit of a blind spot where Star Wars is concerned. They're certainly pretty funny people when they really want to be.